surgically before they spread. But ovarian cancer tends to spread out in the abdominal cavity. These are little tumor nodules that are magnified through laparoscope. Um, we're looking underside of the right diaphragm over the liver, and you can see all those little seedlings of cancer. Um, so very few patients with this type of disease are 100% permanently cured. That said, in the last decades, women are living longer. And this is an interesting slide that was given to me recently. Uh, I've never seen the data put into quite this format before. Um, so over the last uh, few decades, there has been an increase in life expectancy for a woman with ovarian cancer. So uh, if you look at the average woman with ovarian cancer, she's gained about 1.8 years of life. Now, unfortunately, most of that comes from an increase in just median survival, which is how long you live, not to say that you're cured. Um, cures have increased very so slightly and really added about um, 0.4 years, so about three months, um, because a small number of women are cured when that averages out over all the women with ovarian cancer, we get the 0.4 uh, years. Um, whereas median survival has added most of the improved survival, and that's primarily because of the development of more aggressive surgery and platinum-based chemotherapy. So, in, in thinking about reducing mortality from ovarian cancer, we can talk about therapy, and you just heard exciting news about heart inhibitors and how we're making strides there, but again, that's probably most likely to help women live longer, not actually permanently cure cancers. Um, I'm going to give two talks, one here uh, about screening and early detection, and then in the lunch session about prospects for prevention. Um, but again, screening and early detection is a paradigm that's worked in cervical cancer, it's worked in colon cancer, breast cancer, it may have some role in prostate cancer. So we'd like to be able to screen in some way, shape, or form to reduce mortality from ovarian cancer. Right now, the U.S. Preventative Task Force Service, which analyzes available information and makes evidence-based decisions about various medical interventions, gives ovarian cancer screening a D. I think we all know we don't graduate from high school with D's, you know. <laughs> Hopefully we've got A's and D's. So this is where things have stood for the last few decades. So let's just take a step back and think about screening and, and how it would work. So this slide um, shows the disease outcome, which uh, for cancer could be cancer survival or it could be cancer death. Um, on that timeline, you have overt disease, which is uh, clinically recognizable cancer. So um, the arrow at the bottom of the right shows the usual sort of diagnosis. So we typically diagnose ovarian cancer after there's disease that can be felt on a pelvic exam or seen on a scan that's causing symptoms. And again, for ovarian cancer, two out of three times when we diagnose the overt disease, the patient doesn't ultimately survive. Um, there's some period before diagnosis when the patient's having symptoms. So that potentially represents an opportunity for earlier diagnosis. But then screening moves even further back. And again, ideally, like with colon cancer and with cervical cancer, you're actually screening for a lesion that's not even cancer yet. It's pre-cancer. So it's a polyp in the colon that could turn to cancer, but it's not cancer. So it's at a stage where it can't uh, kill anyone. Likewise, a pap smear, you're not really looking for invasive cancer. You're looking for precancerous dysplasia that can be either excised or frozen or burned and prevent uh, that lesion from ever developing into a cancer. But one thing that people tend to think of, or tend to forget about actually, when they look at the paradigm of screening to affect disease outcome is that it's not good enough just to detect the cancer with screening. Ultimately, it has to affect the survival and that more women have to be cured of ovarian cancer by this earlier detection. So that's really the tough part, is, is proving that. So with respect to ovarian cancer, unfortunately, there's a number of significant barriers to really making a difference in mortality with screening. One is that ovarian cancer is relatively rare. So when you have a very common disease in the population, it's easier to screen and detect a lot of cases and for it to be cost effective while you're saving lives. When you have a rare disease, it's more like looking for a needle in a haystack. So if you're screening everybody, you're going to be finding less cases, saving more li or fewer lives. So um, the rarity of the disease really makes it a challenge to, to do screening, at least in the 
whole population. The ovaries and tubes where ovarian cancer starts are inaccessible. You know, the cervix, we can put a speculum in and look at the cervix. The breast can be palpated. The colon can be scoped. Um, the ovaries and tubes are more difficult um, to look at um, to really uh, try to detect an early lesion. Also, screening for ovarian cancer, at least in uh, 2016 <coughs> means finding an early invasive cancer. It's not like cervical or colon where you're looking for a precancerous lesion. You're hoping to detect invasive cancer before it's spread. So that's really a narrower window to make a difference in mortality. And then, unfortunately, most ovarian cancers at an early stage don't cause enough symptoms to really facilitate the diagnosis. And I'll show you a little bit of data on that. And then finally, when you're screening for cancer, um, unfortunately, there's a propensity to detect cancers that are less aggressive and more slow moving. So yes, you can detect them, but for the most part, these may be cancers that already would have been cured if they were picked up and detected clinically by a physician or some sort of uh, radiographic study based on symptoms. So you might not actually impact the death rate from ovarian cancer. And this slide attempts to demonstrate that. So each of the black lines is a cancer that's growing and um, from the point of an early stage to the end of the line being when it would be metastatic and, and really not curable. So you can see that slowly progressive cancers have on the bottom have a longer line. So those are meant to be six different patients and they're long black lines. And you can see if you're screening annually, you're much more likely to pick them up at a stage where they'd be curable, where they'd still be early. Whereas rapidly progressive cancers that are more virulent and metastatic, you're going to tend to miss some of those if you're doing an annual screen because they're just progressing in months, not years. So the other important thing, which has also been mentioned, I heard in some of the other talks this morning, is we now know that what we call ovarian cancer is several different diseases. And in fact, it's probably not even really ovarian cancer in the sense that it starts in other cells, not in the ovarian cells. It may evolve the ovary prominently, but the, um, the high grade serous cancer you've heard starts in the fallopian tube. Um, the clear cell and endometrioid type cancers start in deposits of endometriosis, which can be on the surface of the ovary or other areas um, in, in the lower abdomen on the peritoneal surface. And then mucinous ovarian cancer, some of these are metastatic to the ovary from the GI tract. Others may actually develop from um, embryologic rest in the ovary. But we really are dealing with different diseases here that have different causes, different genetic alterations, molecular changes, and so we can't really think of screening for ovarian cancer as looking for one disease. And it's instructive to see that when you look at these different types of epithelial ovarian cancer, some of them often present at an early stage, like particularly the endometrioid, the clear cell, the renin or mucinous, whereas the most common type, the high grade serous, which accounts for about two thirds of cases, probably 80% of deaths, rarely presents in stage one. Those are, are usually presenting in more advanced stages, two, three, four. So that is a challenge when we talk about reducing mortality from this disease. So if we're gonna screen for ovarian cancer and try to make a difference, how, how are we gonna approach this? Well, I'll show you a bit about symptoms. There was a lot of enthusiasm for this about a decade ago that women recognizing the symptoms disease and whispers, but if we listen, we could maybe detect more cases early. I don't think that's been the case, although it's not to say that one shouldn't pay attention to those symptoms. A physical exam, so for a long time, one of the uh, main reasons for having an annual GYN visit for a pelvic exam was to feel the ovaries and if anything is abnormal, to consider the possibility of ovary cancer. But it's been shown that the annual pelvic exam is really pretty much a useless uh, exercise in terms of trying to make a difference for ovarian cancer mortality. Um, blood tumor markers, you've all heard about CA125, and there's other markers like H4, over one test that um, look at um, blood markers to try to predict ovarian cancer. Um, much of that's in the context of a woman who has a pelvic mass, and you're wondering, is this benign, as most of them are, or is this one that's cancer that's worrisome that should be referred to a gynecologist? gynecologist. Ultrasound is an imaging technique that can look at the ovaries with uh, fair precision. And then the idea of multimodal screening we'll talk about, uh, which was employed in the most recent UKC talk study, which combined ultrasound and CA125. 
So a few words about symptoms. Again, they're fairly nonspecific. Um, abdominal distension, bloating, pressure, frequent urination, and so forth. Um, it's certainly appropriate to evaluate those sort of symptoms with ultrasound and CA-125 to rule out ovarian cancer, but most of the time those symptoms are not going to be related to ovarian cancer. Um, so um, I, I think it's important that the message be out there in the medical community that ovarian cancer should be considered when women have these symptoms, but the existing evidence doesn't suggest that recognition of those symptoms can really impact ovarian cancer mortality. And this is probably the best study that was done uh, it's a study from Australia by Penny Webb and her colleagues. And it looks at the time from first symptoms to diagnosis on the left, or time from first symptoms to medical consultation on the right. And there's three curves there. You can't really tell there's three curves because they overlap. Um, they're borderline tumors, stage one and two invasive cancer, and stage three and four cancer. And the bottom line here is that the time from symptoms to diagnosis isn't different between early stage ovarian cancer and advanced stage ovarian cancer. So the women with ovarian, advanced ovarian cancer don't have advanced ovarian cancer because their symptoms were ignored for a longer period of time. So CA-125 blood marker um, was discovered in the early 1980s by Bob Bass when he was at Harvard. Um, and it's elevated in the majority of epithelial ovarian cancer, so it's really attested Almost all of you are certainly familiar with because anyone with ovarian cancer who's being treated and monitored has that test done pretty much every time they go to the doctor. And it definitely, over time, the serial levels monitor or, or mirror the course of a woman's disease. The cancer's growing, it's going up. The cancer's responding, it's going down. Unfortunately, it's not elevated in all stage one ovarian cancers, and that may be because they're smaller and don't produce uh, enough CA125 to elevate the level. Also, a lot of the stage one cancers are not the typical high-grade serous. They might be the mucinous or clear cell or in vitro and might not make as much CA125. Uh, as I mentioned, CA125 is useful in distinguishing a benign from malignant pelvic mass and deciding whether a general OBG1 or gynecologic oncologist should do the surgery. As a screening test, there was sort of a red flag early on in that about 3% of postmenopausal women had an elevated level. So if you're gonna use it as a screening test, you know pretty much immediately it was apparent that there'd be a lot of false positive results. Pelvic ultrasound is an imaging of choice for looking at the ovaries. So on the right is a normal ovary with just some functional small cysts that are the black areas with the F. Um, ovarian cancer is not only a cyst, but it's larger and it's not just black on the inside, but also has these solid areas. And you can see the three arrows forming a triangle. There's a solid area of tissue growing inside of this cystic mass, which is concerning for ovarian cancer. So in the 1990s and 2000s, the uh, NCI did a large study called the PLCO study, where they said, we're going to screen for prostate, lung, colon, and ovarian cancer, because these are four types of cancer that cause, cause a lot of cancer mortality, and when we think that screening early detection could make a difference. Um, so focusing on the ovarian part of the PLCO study, they randomized 78,000 women to screening or no screening. The screening was yearly CA125 for six years and yearly ultrasound for four years. And then the patients were followed for uh, up to 12 years. And disappointingly, there was really no improvement in ovarian cancer mortality. So again, 39,000 women screened, 39,000 women not screen, and first of all, just focusing on the stage of the cancer, you can see that in the screen arm, 78% uh, had stage three and four disease, and in the control arm, 77% had stage three and four disease. There was no stage shift, and this is something we're gonna come back to when we talk about the new case <coughs> top study, where there was a stage shift. And then the bottom line is that there were actually more ovarian cancer deaths in the screen arm than the control arm, but that's not a statistically significant difference. The conclusion from the study is basically that there was no difference in terms of mortality. So the mortality ratio was 1.18, again, more deaths in the screened arm, but the 95% confidence intervals overlapped, one being that it was not a statistically significant difference. The problem was that in the screening arm, 3,200 women had surgery and 5% of those women had at least one serious complication due to the surgery. So 
The conclusion from the trial was that not only did the screening not reduce mortality from ovarian cancer, but it did cause harm. Um, so that was uh, fairly sobering, and this was um, not too many years ago, in 2011, this was published in the Journal of American Medical Association. So therefore, the initial slide that I showed the U.S. Preventive Task Force recommendation of a D for screening, don't do it. It doesn't help and um, causes harm. So now I'm going to tell you about some of the findings from the U.K. Uh, collaborative trial of ovarian cancer screening, which I'll refer to as the U.K. CTOX study. Um, the study was probably the largest prospective study ever done in women uh, for any disease of any kind. And it was the brainchild of Ian Jacobs, uh, my good friend, who I've known um, since the early 90s. Um, he's a gynecologic oncologist and um, has since moved on to become a dean of the medical school and now a chancellor of the University of New South Wales in Sydney. But um, he came to Duke, where I was a junior faculty in 1990, and spent a year with Bob Bass. And um, again, the study was really his brainchild. Stephen Skates it was the development of the Roca Multimodal Screening Algorithm, a statistician from Mass General. Uh, Usha Menon um, at the University College London. Uh, on the left was really the workhorse who ran the study with a huge study team. This study probably cost $150 million over the course of 15 years and was conducted all across the United Kingdom. And really, the basis for the study was Stephen Skates' um, statistical work looking at CA125 and saying, well, yes, an annual value really doesn't perform well as a screen, but look at what happens when you follow women with slightly elevated CA125s over time that never develop ovarian cancer versus women who wind up having ovarian cancer. So there's a CA125 level from six women on this slide, and three of them didn't develop ovarian cancer. So the, the lines two, four, and six, which are basically flat line, just sort of jigging up and down a little bit, are women who over the course of six years didn't develop ovarian cancer. And then the number one, three, and five, you can see women whose CA125 levels really started to rise. So Skates developed this rogue algorithm based on the absolute value of the CA125. So a CA125 of 100 is a lot more worrisome than a CA125 of 40, even though they're both elevated, just as an absolute value. And then the slope of the line, or the trend over time, also very important that it's rising, is very concerning. So in the UK CTOX trial, the enrollment was from 2001 to 2005 for women over 50 in the UK. Um, screening ended in 2011, so I think the average woman had screening for seven years. And then just in December of 2015, the mortality results were released. So there was a four year gap there because again, they weren't studying the incidence of ovarian cancer, they were studying the mortality rate from ovarian cancer. So, the average woman with advanced ovarian cancer lives about four years, so they waited four years from the end of the screening to look at the effect on mortality. And there was a control arm of over 100,000 women who did not have screening. Um, I think it's worth noting that there may have been some contamination of that no screening arm because it's possible that some of those women did get CA125s, and did they really represent a pure no screening arm? Not sure about that. There's probably a little bit of screening going on there. But the two screening arms were one an ultrasound arm where women were getting an ultrasound annually, and then if there was anything concerning, they were referred for a clinical evaluation, which probably included a CO25 most of the time. Um, and then a multimodal arm of 50,000 plus who had an annual CO125, but that was again done every year and analyzed with the rogue algorithm. And so some women may have had a quote unquote elevated CA125, but they didn't just go right to surgery. If um, it was only mildly concerning, they would have another repeat CA125 in six or 12 weeks. And then if the risk was rising, the level going up, then they might be referred for an ultrasound or a clinical evaluation. So it was an attempt to not just react to every CA125 that was quote unquote elevated. So more and more, detail on the multimodal screening. The rogue algorithm, again, is based not only on the CA125 level, but on the patient's age, menopausal status, and also taking into account their baseline risk of ovarian cancer if 
they have a family history or BRC1 or 2 or other mutation that would increase their risk. So someone with a higher risk to begin with due to family history or no mutation would have a lower threshold for triggering an ultrasound and a clinical evaluation. So in practice, what this meant, that was 90% of women who had the multimodal ROCA test were told you have a low risk value, you're going to be just coming back in a year for a repeat. 8.5% had a repeat in that 6 to 12 week sort of window because there was a slightly elevated risk. And some of those would eventually go on to clinical evaluation. And then 1.5% had an ultrasound. And if the ultrasound and ROCO were concerning enough, a clinical evaluation to consider for surgery. So I think it's important to remember that number. If this sort of screening is done, 10% of women will be told your result isn't completely normal. So think about the anxiety that might come into play there, not just from the patient who's worrying about whether she has ovarian cancer, but also the physician who's worrying about whether their patient has ovarian cancer. You know, and think about when do you pull the trigger to do something surgically. So one reassuring uh, aspect of the UKC Tox trial is that in the multimodal screening control um, and ultrasound arms, an equal um, cumulative incidence of ovarian cancer was found. So again, we're not trying to prevent cancer in this study, we're trying to reduce mortality. So you would expect the same number of ovarian cancers in each of the arms of the trial. You would just hopefully have a lower mortality rate in the screening arms. And so this just shows the cumulative ovarian cancer of incidence over the 14 years of the UK CTOX study. And it's equal in all arms. So again, reassuring that um, the study worked the way it was supposed to. So um, some of the main conclusions or take homes from the study were that the multimodal screening approach had a higher sensitivity for ovarian cancer. So 86% versus 63 for ultrasound. And sensitivity means if there's cancer there, do you pick it up with the test? So the multimodal screening picked up more of the cancers with, with, with the screening approach than having an ultrasound. The specificity sounds very high for both tests, 99.8 versus 98.2. But that 1.6% difference, which is better for the multimodal screening, makes a huge impact in the real world because the specificity means if you don't have ovarian cancer, that it's saying you don't have ovarian cancer, that you're not having um, um, false uh, positives there where it's saying that someone has cancer when they don't. Because there's many more women out there in the population who don't have ovarian cancer than who do. So it's incredibly important to have a very, very high specificity. That 1.6% difference in specificity, what that translates into is a lot higher number of operations for cancer detected for ultrasound screening compared to the multimodal screening. So only four surgeries for every invasive cancer detected in the UK CTOX study compared to 17 with ultrasound. And for the past few decades, the threshold we've been sort of bandying about is, well, it would be okay to have 10 operations so with the multimodal screening, you're doing much better than that. So I talked about stage shift before and how there was no stage shift in the PLCO study, that about 78% of women who were diagnosed with ovarian cancer in PLCO had advanced stage disease, whether they were in the screening or no screening arms. And this is type 1 cancers. I showed you that slide earlier with all the different histologic types of ovarian cancer. This is the non-high-grade serous group that tends to have a better prognosis. So you can see um, on the left side of the slide, 83% is circled. 83% of women with ovarian cancer in the control group had early stage disease for these type 1 histologies. And that wasn't a whole lot different on the right side. The multimodal screening group, 88% of the type 1 cancers were in early stage. For the ultrasound group, 75% were in early stage. Those differences are not statistically significant. So for those less aggressive types of ovarian cancer, screening didn't really improve the early detection, but most of these women are gonna be cured when treated clinically anyway. Really what we're most interested in seeing a stage shift is for the high-grade serous ovarian cancers, the type two cancers. So you can see here on the left in the control group, 17% of the women who went up with ovarian cancer were in an earlier stage, compared to 18% for the ultrasound group, 
but the multimodal screening group, 33% were diagnosed in an early stage disease. So you've got about a 16% increase in diagnosing women at an early stage of disease in the multimodal screening arm of the trial. And so we'll look at some of the mortality results now. So on the x-axis, horizontally, is the years from 0 to 14. And then on the y-axis, going up and down, is the cumulative ovarian cancer mortality. So you'd like the mortality to be lower. And the green line um, is, well, actually, the blue line is the no screening group. The ultrasound group is the green line. And then the red line is the multimodal group. And you can see that if you just look at ovarian cancer mortality, it was 15% reduced in the multimodal group at 14 years, 11% with the ultrasound group. Neither of these results were statistically significant. So for the multimodal, it was 0 0.1. That means that there's a 1 in 10 chance that the result could not be significant. Generally, you like to see a p-value of at least uh, under 0.05, which is only a 1 in 20 or 5% chance that the results could be false positive. And when you include in the peritoneal cancer, so in 2000, when this study started, we didn't really appreciate that peritoneal cancer was part of the same spectrum with the ovarian and fallopian tube cancer. So that had not been included in the primary analysis. When you add in the peritoneal cancer deaths, it, it doesn't even look quite as good. So you went from a 15% mortality for just ovarian cancer with multimodal screening to then um, only 11% um, with multimodal screening if you included in peritoneal cancer deaths. <coughs> so the conclusion from the study was that it was not a positive study, at least in terms of the main pre-specified analysis of how they would look at this data. However, one thing that also wasn't really appreciated uh, completely at the beginning of the UKC TOC study is that it takes time for mortality and benefit from screening to emerge in many different types of cancer. This is not unique to ovarian cancer. So here's just, uh, this is not a trial, but it's looking at um, mortality from breast cancer in Sweden, which went down after the introduction of screening. So the green line is the mortality in the group um, that had mammography screening, and the red line is the group that didn't have screening. You can see that mammography reduced uh, mortality from breast cancer by about 29% in the screen group. But again, looking at the x-axis, which is time, it wasn't until about five years, it wasn't until after about five years that that improvement in mortality started to emerge. And it's thought that the reason for that is that when you start a screening program on day one, like in the first year, two years, three years, you're picking up cancers that are already there and the term that's used as prevalent cancers. So that already, those cancers are already there in the population that you're screening when you start the screening. And your ability to impact on mortality from those prevalent cancers is gonna be, by definition, less if they're already there and growing even before you started your screening program. Really, it's incident cancers, new cancers that develop